Thanks very much. Uh, our second speaker to give us a perspective on these issues is Georgie Somerset, who may be well known to a lot of people here. Georgie is actively involved in a family-owned beef property in southern Queensland, and she told me that uh, part of the struggle to get here was some burning off yesterday and some weighing of cattle because they had to go at five o'clock this morning. Uh, she lives there with a husband and three children when they're not away at boarding school. Georgie is also president of the Queensland Rural Women's uh, Queensland Rural Regional and Remote Women's Network, a director of the Queensland Rural Assistance Authority and involved in numerous community and industry organisations. She recently completed a seven year term on the National Rural Advisory Council which provided the opportunity to visit regions in every state assessing the impact of drought on farm businesses and rural communities. She's involved in industry advisory groups for rural skilling and labour strategy issues with the Queensland Department of Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry, as it's known this week, as well as chairing the steering committee on gateway schools for agribusiness. She is also a fellow of the Australian Rural Leadership Foundation and the Australian Institute of Company Directors. In her spare time, she's an active presenter at industry conferences and a participant in social media such as Twitter. The challenge we put to Georgia, Georgie today is to provide us with her thoughts about how agriculture can or should respond to the increasing demands that are being made by consumers and the increasing transparency that is part and parcel of the digital age. Please welcome Georgie. Thanks Mick and I'm really pleased I didn't use the Kansas video. My 11 year old daughter when she saw that said well if that was video by 11 year old why aren't my brothers out there doing this sort of cool stuff too. So the, the challenge was laid down that the boys in our district should be producing exactly the same thing and most of that was filmed by an 11 year old. So that gives you some idea of the capacity of a, a, a pretty simple camera at home. Thanks for that Mick. Um, really pleased to be here and talk about community expectations. I come from a background of marketing and communications not from science. I never got around to doing the psychology degree. Um, I just muck around with um, collecting people. I often say that I spend my, my time linking people and collecting people. And really passionate about being a beef producer. So I want you to stop for a minute and we, we heard from a couple of processors this morning and I just want you to think about a factory and uh, Tim also alluded to factory farming. There's been a bit of talk about it, or, or Mick did. So I want you to think about a factory and, and what might come out of a factory. Different people in the room might have different perspectives on that. And I want you to think about a, a factory where the ceiling is actually the sky and it goes on forever. And the factory floor is a biodiversity of grasses that are a mixture depending on where that factory is. And the walls of the factory are made up of trees and fences. And in some parts, when I lived in Western Queensland, they literally did go on forever. You couldn't see the end of your factory wall. And the factory machines are actually a biodynamic machine that does an amazing job with a whole range of elements. It's, it's my cattle. And this is the factory I run. And I don't want to step away from saying that I do run a factory. But what I do is, unlike people like David and John who get really clear specifications, they know how, how heavy those cattle are going to be. They know roughly what fat depth they're going to be and they pay according to that. I get really random elements. I get the sun, I get the rain, I get evaporation, I get frost. We know we're going to get it all, we just don't know when, we don't know how much, we don't know with what intensity. And we, we, what the one fixed thing is our incredibly precious resource, the soil. And we take that and we combine it with these other random elements with people. And the people are a real key to what I do in agriculture. And so what I talk about now, and I got to talk at a Target 100 thing recently which was around sustainability, is I talk about what I do like this. Because my message is that the steak on your plate doesn't happen by chance. It happens because we have a lot of science and technology and we have people who are out there every day monitoring, measuring, looking after the cattle so that David and John can get this really sustainable, um, measurable product each time into their processing works. So this is, I just wanted to give you that, to give you a different view on how you can communicate with people because other people understand what a factory is. You take something, you do something to it and you get a different result at the other end. I take random elements and produce steak or beef. So Mick asked me to come and talk about community expectations and how they've changed. 
And this is what I think the community expects. They think they, they expect to have safe food, they expect to walk into a, a supermarket or 7-Eleven or a farmer's market and buy something they can trust. They want food that they can afford and they want it available every day, which is one of the challenges for us. What they assume is that it'll always be provided for them, is that lament of Australians have never gone hungry, that there'll be acceptable animal welfare and that the land will be looked after and that they won't have to emotionally engage other than at a pallet level. It's a, it's a byproduct thing. We just want to have nice food that we can enjoy. The challenge for industry is that we expect that Australians will want to buy Australian food. We think that's a priority. We expect that they'll be willing to pay for it so we get a fair return. And there's fantastic discussions on Ag Chat Oz about some of the, the challenges of returns and changing your production systems if, if it's not paying. And that it, we expect that agriculture is important. We know that it's a key pillar of the economy. You know, in, in southern Queensland, it is the second highest employer after healthcare. So regardless of the resource sector, the ABARES report at the moment is its health sector, then agriculture. And that's not the downstream supply chain. That's not um, the JBSs and the ACCs. That's agriculture. So, you know, we are significant and we know that, but we think we're important to our economy, to our landscape, to our community and to our national identity. That's our expectation. And we assume that consumers know a bit about this. They, I, they, we assume that they know what we do. You talk about mustering cattle. People in this room probably know what that is. I talk to people who have no idea what it is. And I'll touch a bit on that in a minute. We assume often as industry that they understand how much work and science and technology and research we put into what we do and how much we invest in our production systems. And the other thing we assume is that someone else, I'm still looking for this someone else, will explain this to people. And I say, who else... Who will that be? So let's go on a bit of a journey and think about how can we talk about it differently and how can we meet those expectations if they're so far from ours. Um, I love the example the other day in the extended family and we had a, a birthday party and this particular stepson of my sister's has three degrees. He's done science, forensic science and just completed medicine and will be a doctor next year. And he said to my 17-year-old son, um, what exactly is aged beef, by the way? Ben, having completed his Cert 3 in agriculture and about to head to the Territory, firmly committed beef producer, then went on to explain what aged beef is. And I was listening from outside and I, I sort of then went on to explain that, you know, where he lives, where he comes from in Melbourne, he could often access uh, dry aged beef and what that might be and that, you know, if he's finding the budget a bit tight, you can actually age some beef yourself, it's quite, quite okay to age it yourself in a cryovac in the, in the fridge and his closing comment was, I had no idea, I thought it just came from really old cows. So this is my frustration, I had a, a branded beef product for six years that I coordinated ten families. The language we speak as producers isn't something that consumers can understand. You know, we talk about different things in beef that, that they have no understanding of. So aged beef was just that, that classic sort of um, example of what goes on. People eating food, they don't think about where it comes from. And they actually don't want to think about where it comes from. Um, they just want a meal that will satisfy and sustain and be affordable. Because one of the challenges for them is, is all the other things going on in their life. We think... That, that food is really important. But for them it's about balancing the budget, it's about the sun's broken arm, it's about um, the challenges at work, it's about whether I'll have a job next month, it's about fitting the car in for a service this week. It's those sorts of things that are pressing on their mind. They're not actually that worried about where their food comes from, they just expect to be able to go and get it. So they don't spend hours. We on the other hand as farmers think about it day in, day out. It consumes our life. Um, we think about meeting land management s s sort of specifications, we may think about the specifications required by the end user, we think about animal welfare, um, we think about the cotton gin, the grain trader, you know, whoever we're dealing with and whoever we've got to liaise with. We're constantly thinking about how can we tweak our machines, whether that be your soil and your crop or whether for me it's the cattle or whether it's the pigs and the eggs and the chooks and so forth, we're thinking about that constantly. But the people on the other end aren't. So this is where Tim was saying, we think science and we think people will think this is important. They just want food. 
and how we need to relate to them is more on that emotional level. So one of the things that we often forget is that consumers are actually just people like us. And as industry, I think we tend to aggregate them into consumers and community. And there's a danger in that because this is about one conversation at a time. And this is where social media has come into its own, where one conversation at a time can be held to answer questions, to put forward perspectives. We might be meeting community expectation on farm, but there's a breakdown between what we do on farm and what people here we do. And unless the people growing food and fibre in Australia understand how to communicate what they do, there will continue to be that breakdown. So we need food and fibre producers who are confident, uh, not just in how they produce, but confident in how to communicate that to other people. And that's one of our challenges. For me, while we talk in generalities about industry and consumer, relationships won't be built. So there's my thing. That they need to feel confident to share their story one, conf one conversation at a time with people who eat food and wear clothes and preferably both at the same time. Although with a son, my oldest son going to school, is that might not be at both at the same time next week. Hey Mick. So one of the challenges is that agriculture is a broad church and we talk about industry, but as we just heard, Target 100 is about the red meat industry. I know that other industries have got campaigns going. We're a very broad church, but how do we gather that and garner that enthusiasm and the motivation that's out there to do a fantastic job um, to, com to build those relationships one, time, one at a time? Trust is the absolutely critical thing. So there's a, a guy called Charliano who some of you may have heard at some of the events in the last 12 or 18 months. MLA have had him out for a few, few things. He talks about Coburg's moral hierarchy and how farmers are incredibly trusted within that moral hierarchy. And uh, the Ever Trusted Reader's Digest survey this year, uh, farmers are, are the tenth most trusted profession in Australia. It's pretty darn good. We come in there behind paramedics and firefighters and people like that that we would, as farmers, say are probably more trustworthy than us as well. We'd, we'd put them up there for the things they're doing. So we're the tenth most trusted profession in Australia. It's, it's not a bad place to come from. The community actually thinks we're okay. The community actually trusts us to produce food. They trust us that they can walk in day in, day out, any hour of the day and get food. Safe food that's been well produced. What they don't understand you know, is, is, and what we have to do and explain in their language is how we do it. So we might just go to that Alberta ag clip. I just want to show you something that is, is a finance company in Alberta actually produced this. And we'll just see about, watch about half of this. Contrast that to the really good statistics that were in the AYOF clip this year, 
that just didn't have the images. They talked about Durham wheat in the facts. What did they show us? They showed us the pasta, because that's the connection. They talked about the malt barley, but what did they show us? They showed us the beer. They made that emotional connection. I love a bowl of pasta, I love my beer. This is something that I use every day. This is where, this is the whole of industry. If we watch to the end, and I really encourage you to go and do a search for it, talked about honey, talked about you know, the whole range and spectrum of industry. And it was funded by a finance corporation. So I'll throw that one out there. I think there's a couple of um, banks in the room. So one of the challenges we have is the language that we use. And if you look at the comments on there, it's, it's also about the music. Who sang that? So I've had to put up who actually sang it and where you can get the lyrics and uh, to, you know, ag and what's important about ag. I landed on the factory example because a lot of people work in a similar sort of field. They work in a business where they have a planned output, they develop sales plans and marketing plans around expected output. And, and you guys would be the same. You know roughly what you're going to produce. You're not quite sure if you're ever going to get it into those markets or at what price they're going to pay, but you've got a planned output. I, don't ha I have to work very hard to have a planned output. You know, Rob and I work constantly to monitor and manage what we do. But if you use an example that people can relate to, it gives them a chance to relate back to you. Just coming back to speaking with one voice, and I'll just touch on what happened last week. So what I saw last week was a report on how a foreign country treated Australian livestock. And I saw, um, from, from my humble abode, industry speak with one voice nationally and internationally, and I saw agribusiness take affirmative action. So I saw that Wellard's YouTube long before I saw any other stories. It was preemptive work, and, the, and Wellard spoke with a language that was feelings and facts. And, and there was significant hits on that by the end of Monday. I then saw farmers and advocates across Australia take individual action on social media. Um, and I refer to Twitter as my water cooler. I can call in there any time of the day, never know who will be there, what they'll be talking about, but I can usually have a conversation with someone. And for someone who works alone, that, that's pretty handy. Some people will consider what happened last week random individual actions of people tweeting, but what I saw was a really consolidated, co coordinated effort. There was hashtagging, which is where you put the hashtag in front and you can search on those things and it collects um, sort of followings. Uh, I saw collaboration, I saw support for agribusiness, I saw a lot of support for what was being done by industry organisations and even by politicians. I then saw an individual that night take, who's very highly informed and very passionate about the live export industry, represent industry one tweet at a time. One person at a time, one response at a time, regardless of the personal abuse hurled at that person. To the to this extent that there is actually a tweet limit which they discovered close to midnight that night and they had to knock off Twitter and start answering those tweets and responding again in the early hours of the morning. So I think it was 232 individual tweets. What I then saw was people going, I might need to find out a bit more about this. I don't think I know enough about this story. Um, can, you, can you give me some more information? And because this person had YouTube videos and had lived the story, they could give that. What I also saw was people with no skin in the game. I saw rural, you know, regional newspaper journalists, teachers, people who work in regional communities being abused and denigrated by people on social media who just dusted themselves off and got back in there and responded because they really believe that agriculture and the food and fibre industry is worth fighting for. And it was just great to see. It was like this, there was a, there was a groundswell of we're not going to let this happen again. Many of the issues I believe were deflected and the widespread condemnation of agriculture wasn't the same as it was 12 months ago. There were, there were other factors obviously but I think we have learnt some lessons. But what I didn't see was industry leaders and industri industry organisations supporting these individuals or making it easy for people like me to actually go and lend my support. So I did actually go and do the NFF thing. I found that on Twitter, I went and did it but it was, it was actually quite cumbersome to do. I had to you know, cut the emails into 20 at a time because you can't mass email um, politicians and so on and so forth because it was quite cumbersome. So it wasn't, you know, it, it took more than a couple of minutes. It was sort of a concerted thing. I couldn't do it on the iPad. I had to go to the computer to do it and so forth. What these people didn't have was key messages or key points and key research provided to them before Monday as a resource that they could use sh and share one-on-one -on -one to establish trust. So one individual who'd really lived that industry was in there sharing a lot, 
but other people didn't know whether they had the right message, weren't sure whether they were spot on. And nobody I saw in industry was giving us those key messages to tweet and retweet. The key messages just weren't coming out. So over the last 12 months, I guess I've heard a lot of people say that we can't afford to have another June 2011. What I'm not seeing is that reaching, right, rising to the height of agendas for agribusiness and industry organisations. And that's my challenge. You know, what, what are you doing to share our story? If you're not putting this on, the, on your organisation's agenda, and I don't mean the final item before close of meeting, which happens at five past five, if you're not going to add it to your business's priorities, if you're in agribusiness, if you're not going to have these conversations one-on-one -on -one and be really clear about how you share your message, then who do you think will or should? You know, who, it's a bit like Tim's message, he's never been asked. If you're not going to lead this, I don't know who the people outside this room are who, go, who are going to or have the resources to because you're the recognised leaders for our organisations and industries. You know, what do you, what do you provide um, to support advocates across Australia? What's your business doing to say, you know, celebrate the champions? If you're in finance, what are you doing to celebrate the agribusiness champions and share that message with your commercial partners in, the, in urban areas? How are you sharing that message? If you're in industry organisations, what are the key messages? Where can I go to on your website that gives me access to the research and the key messages about what we need to share and how we need to talk about this? You know, we're coming into what I call the peak party season, Christmas time. Have you guys got your messages ready when you're talking to someone? Do they realise how long it takes to produce that wine and that beer? You know, I say it takes four years minimum to produce a great tasting steak. And that's not taking into consideration the science and the genetics and the technology behind that. That's pretty much just the production window. And they wolf down a steak in a few minutes, but did anyone share with them that it took four years to get there? You know, are you going to talk to them about that, about where the cotton came from that they're wearing, how long it takes to produce, how fantastic the industry is and how water efficient it is? That we have one of the, the most efficient rice industries in Australia and that we can feed the world. These are the things that, you know, how are we going to share those messages? I shall just go back. I, putting it in their language, a great one I always talk about is, you know, the note comes home from school, there's a few parents in the room, and it says there's been a head lice outbreak. And it's, um, yeah, there's, a, there's been a few in our house over time. That's one of the good things about boarding school, really. You don't stick the note in the drawer and think, I'll deal with that next week. You know, there's the immediacy of dealing with that before your child goes back in the door to school the next morning. It's a bit the same. I say it's a bit the same when we're looking after our cattle. We don't notice our cattle have some lice and then say, oh, look, we'll just, we'll just go away for the weekend or we'll just go and do something else. Or we, we, we plan to do this this week so we won't treat them. I say, we treat them just like we treat our children. We get in there and we do it straight away. When I was managing a branded beef product and they would talk to us about, do you treat your cattle? I'd say, well, do you, know, do you vaccinate your children? I said, I know some people don't. And similarly, some beef producers don't vaccinate. But I don't want my cattle getting sick later on. I want them to be healthy for their, the rest of their life. So I do vaccinate my cattle. And when you put it in those sorts of terms, they go, well, of course you'd vaccinate. You know, you don't want them getting to 12, 14 months and getting pulpy kidney. You don't want black leg. You know, the, so the language that you use is often about bringing it down to, to their level. So I guess for me, you know, what... We often come from a point of lack, and yet I think our industry is just so abundant. It has given me more opportunities than I could have ever had if I'd gone into a traditional marketing or other, other type of career. I think it's strong and it's viable and that we're trusted to do the job well and that we've got a strong economic future. But for some reason, we spend half our time talking about what we don't have. We've got amazingly passionate young people wanting to come in. I, I get the privilege of sitting on the Horizon Scholars Selection Panel and have done for three years and just recently shortlisted 50 applicants uh, for women, young women and, and mature age women wanting to study agriculture through Skills Queensland. These people want to be there. Are you talking them down? Are you talking them out? It's a bit like David was saying, he's really excited his daughter's done medicine. I sure as hell hope she's going to the bush because that's where we need them. Um, now, what, what are you doing to actually engage with these young people? Are you mentoring some young people in your, you know, to come into agriculture? Are you mentoring people at high schools, young people at high schools and universities to take their accounting and their legal and their HR skills into agribusiness? 
This, this is where we need to be. We actually need to be in there, in that place, engaging with young people and telling them what a fantastic opportunity and a fantastic industry we have. And one of my eternal frustrations is how indus this industry does such a great job of talking itself down. I've never been in an industry that is so negative about its future and yet to me it is incredibly strong and robust and abundant. And, and the other thing is how do you picture our trade? You know, when you speak about a, a lawyer or a teacher and the sort of training they've got to go through or a builder or a plumber, you've probably got a clear picture in your mind of what's involved. What's involved in coming into agribusiness? Have that clear. Think about the career opportunities that you can talk about personally, one-on-one -on -one with young people. You know, and they're consumers. They're our, they're our next consumers. So we have actually got the third generation coming in. He's heading up to Newry Station, Ken, so you know, I should come and see you for some tips. Very excited about that. But even the next one who wants to study accounting, you know, I sort of say, well, you could work in agribusiness. There's lots of opportunities there. And, and I believe that it's been really good to us. So I see on Ag Chat Oz, when I hop on there, young people, really energised people. I see people living in the city who are the Tims of the world, who've come from the bush. They want to connect with consumers. What they struggle with is how to get that message across and how to make the link from people like me who are living and breathing it every day to the people that they're engaging with around their water coolers. How can we develop some really clear messages and some ways for them to engage? And what are you doing about it? Because if you keep leaving it to someone else, it won't happen. I think eat up might be our, our answer. So my focus is always that I'm, my job is to produce a fantastic tasting steak every time. And I'm really clear that that's what my job is. It's not about growing grass and growing cattle and all those things. I'm really focused on producing great tasting beef. And these are the other things in our industry that we need to focus on. What's going to connect to a consumer? They're not interested really in how I manage my grass or the genetics I use or the types of crops and fodder crops. They want to know what's in it for them. And what's in it for them is that I give them uh, a tenderness guaranteed great tasting steak every time. So there's a choice. We can either be a sunset industry or we can be a sunrise industry. And for me, I believe agriculture has got a huge future. As it said in the clip, I've got a love for this land and I want to connect farmers to consumers. And I'm looking for industry and agribusiness to take the lead in that so that we can actually do it together.